Hey people, today I'm gonna to be doing something a bit out of the ordinary. Um, I'm going to be using my own hair that I just showed me removing, and I'm going to do my best to isolate the proteins that are found in hair. Now, as you may or may not know, um, hair is composed of the protein keratin, um, which is the same material that your uh, fingernails are made out of as well. <clears throat> and with that thinking, then going forward, one in theory could be able to maybe do something called hydrolysis on hair because people do something called hydrolysis on proteins all the time. Um, and what that basically means is you're using either strong acids or strong bases at usually increased temperatures to, to cleave those proteins into multiple pieces um, because proteins are polymer. So I've never really seen any literature about this and I tried looking up some and there have been there have been some studies about people um, doing some hydrolysis on um, hair but it's not really definitive in their methods um, so I figured I would do some exploratory science um, and see for myself and maybe if I'm lucky I'll get the chance to eat it and I was really inspired to make this video based on this video that I watched from um, this guy's channel who I will put the link to his video in the description where basically he dissolved his hair I assume it's his hair in sulfuric acid and left it for like 20 days um, and it ended up being like this kind of goopy material and so I thought I could do kind of an extension of this video so using the hair that had come off my body from uh, great clips then um, I wanted to first get a mass of the uh, hair with the container um, just to get a general idea of uh, what I was working with here and I found with the Ziploc bag that it weighed about mm, 16 grams or so which was uh, quite a bit um, but you subtract from the mass of the bag itself which is uh, about I think one and a half uh, grams or so um, so you have about eh, 13 grams and um, I put this into the bottom of a beaker stuffed it down to make sure that uh, I could fill as much water to the top without it maybe splashing out um, and now I wanted to work on making my uh, acid solution that I was going to be doing the hydrolysis in um, of course, hair does not mix too well with just straight water. Um, but the hope was that, as per that um, other YouTuber's video, that it would slowly begin to become better and better dissolved as time went on. Now, if you listen closely at that point, then you'll notice that there's uh, some kind of faint hissing going on as I add the acid. And what's happening is that's heating up the water uh, where I add the acid because that's a very exothermic process. And so I think there's actually gas that's trying to escape as I pour it. Now, after I add the sulfuric acid, um, which I was targeting a molar concentration of about six normal or so, um, it immediately did not look like the hair was dissolving, but this is not really what I expected. Um, I was thinking that um, after I started increasing the temperature that within a couple hours, then it would hopefully start because in the original video, then it was all done at rim temp. Um, and that's looking pretty nasty. So to target my goals, I set the stirring to high and I put the heat to start at a... Um, a moderate temperature not to overdo anything so I put the plastic cover on the container uh, so as to prevent the water from boiling out of the container so much um, not only to allow the concentration of acid to remain the same but to also prevent just the uh, beaker from drying out since I'd be leaving it at a high temperature um, overnight and I really didn't want any disasters or destroying the hair that I really only had one batch worthy um, and after a couple hours I noticed that the hair actually wasn't together anymore I couldn't actually grab any of the pieces and when I shine light you can still see that there's some like particles moving inside there but they're they're not it's not hair anymore I don't know really know what to describe it um, at this point it's probably just 
kind of short polymers, I would say. Um, it's hard. It's hard to tell right now, just because um, it's a pretty it's a pretty dark solution. So getting like good footage of this material was challenging. At this point, it had been overnight, and um, the water level is much lower than when I started. Um, obviously, the hair has um, pretty much changed, and that solution is looking actually pretty viscous. Um, at this point. More viscous than when we started. So the flask was very very hot at this point um, so I just put it on ice to try and cool it down before I worked with it um, and I accidentally spilled a little bit on the plastic beaker but that's that's not too much of a worry. I also prepared a, uh, a weak solution of sodium hydroxide to maybe dampen some of the uh, the strength of the acid just a little bit um, because to be honest it was a little bit challenging to uh, breathe in these conditions and um, as you probably heard just then there was a bit of a fizzle um, so there was the boiling of water with the acid and base meeting so I I cooled down the basic solution with ice and poured that in and there was no fizzle this time um, and I was able to somewhat neutralize the acid and make it just easier to work with I didn't want to neutralize it all the way so that would be deprotonating the amino acids um, I was really going for a general neutral pH um, because I thought that would be the best for uh, filtering and precipitating and just working up in general. So on the left I have a slightly stronger solution of sodium hydroxide. I calculated this to be just about the same amount of sulfuric acid that was present and so the idea here is I'll be pipetting um, the solution before I pour it um, and as it filters then the leftover sulfuric acid will be neutralized by the sodium hydroxide below. I had to use rubber bands to secure it to th that beaker um, but eventually I got it to work and this permitted me to um, pour all the material in there to allow it to be filtered. And at first it didn't look like it was going too well um, the black sludge just kind of stayed at the top and I had to change the filter at one point in, in order for it to continue flowing. Um, here's another angle of it coming down so as it hits the liquid below which is now like a light brown uh, no longer blue then it becomes neutralized um, and this also just makes a slower neutralization process in general and is a lot safer to use. So the second filter that I used um, here is a close-up of that with all of its brown gunk that was filtered off. And the first one is quite um, loaded. I don't know how else to describe that. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of precipitate there, um, and it's kind of a gooey a gooey mess, um, kind of hard to work with. The neutralized solution is of course fairly nasty, and I'll just get rid of this. So I then carefully loaded the Griffin beaker with the uh, tar-like substance that had been filtered off, um, which of course used to be my hair, which is still kind of weird. Um, it's really gross to work with and it smelled pretty bad too. Um, it kind of still smelled acidic to me, um, but also kind of like old hair. Um, I'm not really sure how to describe it besides it was just very, very unpleasant. And at this time I had my uh, all of my doors open. I then added strong sodium hydroxide to the solution to try and deprotonate the amino acids that were hopefully present. Um, and then from here, um, after they had been deprotonated, I could perhaps precipitate it in acetone so that the colored material would dissolve in acetone and the amino acids would remain in the water. And when I poured it, it all kind of stayed together, unfortunately. And this is really unfortunate because I was hoping that this would be my ticket out. Um, after this, I really had to think about what I was going to do because I was banking on that idea <laughs> to work. Um, so my next idea was to perhaps try and filter off some of those um, colored materials 
but that didn't work either. It actually didn't filter at all, um, which is a which is a shame. And I ended up having to just kind of pour it back into its original container. I also tried using hexanes to uh, use a solvent system that was very, very nonpolar and see what kind of effects this would have. Did the same thing, unfortunately. Um, so I was kind of at a loss here. Now I noticed after I had added acetone, and I was just letting it sit here to uh, just start thinking about what I'm going to do next, and I saw that it's actually separating into two different layers. So I think I'm just going to manually separate these with pipette and see what comes out. The principle was, was that these were two distinct layers and they both had different attractiveness to acetone. And so my thought process was that one of them could very well be isolated amino acids, that it had just fixed its own problem. Um, so I first took that top layer and I tried dissolving it in more acetone to see if I could get anything to precipitate. And well, it really, it really didn't. So I then had to try and filter it this time. I didn't really expect it to do much because as we saw before, sometimes these systems don't filter too well. Again, I applied my rubber band system and in this instance, the material actually filtered a little bit. I then prepared a um, acidic solution um, to add to the bottom layer in order to try and protonate those amino acids back to their um, acidic forms. And when I added the brown bottom layer, um, well, it looked about the same as it did before, which is kind of what I expected. When I added acetone, however, a shining moment for me occurred because I think, in my mind, I got really, really lucky um, that it happened so distinctly. As I added acetone, I noticed that the top layer, the acetone layer, contained this white precipitate that had formed. And this is exactly what I was going for. Amino acids in their purest form are white and definitely definitely not brown and I was super excited about this so I then um, collected all of the white precipitate into my plastic beaker um, as now the idea was that I would have to evaporate all that acetone and try and get for the amino acid to come out of solution so that I could uh, obtain a powder so I added it to a glass beaker since plastic beakers um, don't contain heat very well. That glass beaker I then added to the top of the hot plate once again and tried to boil down some of that acetone. And eventually, yeah, some uh, stuff precipitated out and um, it was nice and white, beautiful crystals, not a whole lot um, from the uh, 13 grams that we started with, but I was extremely happy to get these. All right, so I've got a little bit of the powder on my palm here, and for the sake of science, it's probably a good idea for me to taste test, right? Um, kind of salty, um, it doesn't taste at all like protein powder to me, uh, that's nasty. I'm thinking maybe there was a little bit of sodium chloride left over, but I'm trying to figure out how, um, perhaps some got washed into the acetone layer, um, but it's definitely distinct, I would say, maybe kind of like old plastic, maybe. Eh. That's all I have for today. Um, I can finally say that I did something useful with my hair. Um, it's never really been long enough to you know, donate or anything. I usually just kind of throw it in the trash or whatever they have at uh, Great Clips. But um, 
thank you so much for watching. Um, we, we, we checked this off our bucket list. Um, and I can, uh, I can rest, I can rest in peace now. So I'll see you next time. Bye.